Hi, welcome back everyone to the final installment of Exploring Othello in 2020. Uh, we get to the end of the play today and uh, as always we'll have a rich discussion with our amazing actors. Uh, Dawn, our brilliant director, fill us in on where we are. Yes, so um, as we will remember, uh, Lodovico has arrived in Cyprus with a commission um, asking that Othello return to Venice and that he leave uh, Cassio in charge in his stead, while at the same time Iago has been quite successful in um, setting Othello to believe the Desdemonas in an extramarital affair with Cassio, um, down to Othello even witnessing Cassio with this handkerchief in his hand. Uh, we've seen Othello strike Desdemona publicly, um, called her a whore. He has uh, sent her away to uh, prepare their um, uh, bedroom. Uh, where we're going to jump in today is sort of immediately following um, a state dinner, as it were. So the sort of like um, final um, celebratory dinner on the island before um, before Othello um, is meant to leave. So we're going to jump in with a what is uh, popularly called the willow scene, which is Amelia and Desdemona um, sort of assessing uh, Othello's behavior as he's ask Desdemona to go before and prepare their chamber. And today uh, we've decided to break the end into three chunks. So we'll have casting changes for, for each of those. And But who are we starting off with today? We will start off with um, Desdemona being played by Jennifer and Amelia being played by Fran. And I have uh, set the casting there for all panelists and attendees in the chat, I'm hitting send right now, so that folks who wanna follow along um, can see that. So if, um, if Jennifer and Fran uh, and the whole group wanna join us now on stage. <laughs> Welcome we'll, back we will, everyone. <laughs> yeah, we will um, jump in right, right on it. Great. How goes it now? He looks gentler than he did. He says he will return incontinent and hath commanded me to go to bed and bid me to dismiss you. Dismiss me? It was his bidding. Therefore, good Amelia, give me my nightly wearing and adieu. We must not now displease him. I would you had never seen him. So would not I. My love doth so approve him that even his stubbornness, his checks, his frowns, prithee, unpin me, have grace and favor. I have laid those sheets you bade me on the bed. Oswan, good faith, how foolish are our minds. If I do die before thee, prithee, shroud me in one of these same sheets. Come, come, you talk. My mother had a maid called Barbary. She was in love and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I have much to do, but to go hang my head all to one side and sing it like poor Barbary, prithee, dispatch. Shall I go fetch your nightgown? No, unpin me here. Uh, this Lodovico is a proper man. A very handsome man. He speaks well. I know a lady in Venice would have walked barefoot to Palestine for a touch of his nether lip. <laughs> <laughs> the poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree. Sing all a green willow, her hand on her bosom, her head on her knee. Sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans. Sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears fell from her and softened the stone. 
Sing willow, willow, will. Lay by these. Willow, willow. Pretty high V. He'll come anon. Sing all a green willow must be my garland. Let nobody blame him, his scorn I approve. Nay, that's not next. Hark, who is that knocks? It's the wind. I called my love false love, but what said he then? Sing willow, willow, willow. If I court more women, you'll couch with more men. So, get thee gone. Good night. My eyes do itch. Does that bode weeping? Tis neither here nor there. I have heard it said so. Oh, these men, these men. Dost thou in conscience think? Tell me, Emilia, that there be women do abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? Why would not you? No, by this heavenly light. <laughs> Nor I neither by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? The world's a huge thing. It is a great price for a small vice. Good troth. I think thou wouldst not. By my troth, I think I should, and undo it when I'd done. Mary, I would not do such a thing for a joint ring, nor for measures of lawn, nor for gowns, petticoats, nor caps, nor any petty exhibition, but for all the whole world? It's pity. <laughs> Who would not make her husband a cuckle to make him a monarch? I should venture purgatory for it. Shrew me if I would do such a wrong for the whole world. Why, the wrong is but a wrong in the world. And having the world for your labor, tis a wrong in your own world. And you might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes. A dozen and as many to advantage as would store the world they played for. But I do think it is their husband's faults if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps. Or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us. Or say they strike us. Or... Scant our former having in despite. Why, we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have sense like them. They see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well. Else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. Good night, good night. God me such usage send, not to pick bad from bad, but by bad mend. Wonderful, we'll pause, we'll pause there for our first little segment of discussion, Ayana. How did it feel, Jennifer? Because I know in previous instances, you were like, ugh, Desdemona. <laughs> How, how did this moment uh, playing Desdemona feel? Um, well, this is the first scene that I ever worked on when I was a kid. And I, this is the part that I played. And so there was a lot of, 
um, sort of time travel, like remembering how I thought about the scene and what was going on versus when I was in school and I worked on the Amelia monologue at the end of this scene. And that's when I, that's when I really was like, I think this might be one of my favorite scenes in all of Shakespeare. Um, because it's, uh, because it's so domestic. It's just like, it's a woman taking off her clothes before her husband comes to bed and they hopefully make up from this fight they've been in. Um, I love that song because it's so weird and it's so, like, it's, she doesn't sing it correctly. Like it, it feels like somebody who's really trying to reach back and remember something that she heard a long time ago. And like, I, I listened to it a couple of times yesterday and it's, it's really difficult to learn. Um, it, it's a strange song, the way that it goes in and out of like major and minor and the way that the chords change. And it's, it's really like, it is an old, old song. And there's, um, yeah, there's something about it that I, I love this scene. I love it. I think it's hard because sometimes I see it staged and it feels it feels like it drags, like it feels a little yeah. sort of long and boring. So that to me is the challenge of the scene is how to make it, it's how to keep the given circumstances um, really live without also anticipating the end. You don't want to, you don't want to be like, this is my death scene, pre-death scene, so. Right, right. Yeah, you don't want to forecast too much, right? You want it to be a moment when she doesn't know exactly what's going to hope happen and that she is still hopeful that they'll make up. And yeah. Yeah. And, and Fran, you get this amazing speech here, which I know you've performed many times. So uh, t walk us through your thought process uh, for this. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, sort of visit, I haven't played the role in a few years, shall we say. Um, so it was fun to go back and revisit her. Um, I found her more fun in this scene than I think I've ever actually played her. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of jokes and the speech still always hits me in the heart that someone is brought to the position where they believe that they have been treated so poorly that they could now seek revenge and it would be the other person's fault. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just that list, I'm assuming that all those things have actually happened to her, mm -hmm. that she has been struck, that she knows that her husband sleeps around. Um, she knows that whatever dowry was given um, to him when they married, he is now squandered, um, that he doesn't take very good care of her and I, I don't personally think that she has slept with Othello, or I don't think she slept with anybody else, but I think she has contemplated it, and she has given herself a reason to do it, which is a really painful place for any human being to be, where they start to contemplate things that actually go against their own real beliefs, but they feel they have no alternative, that they've been backed into a corner. Uh. So, it's, um, it's sad. Uh, I think Amelia is very sad in this. And I, I like that it starts off sort of, uh, I think she's trying to cheer Desdemona up, talking about Lodovico and trying to get her out of this mood, whatever she's in. And um, I sense that I did that a little bit with, with Jennifer's Desdemona, except the import of the scene keeps sort of, is underneath there rumbling and keeps sort of bringing us back to it. So, um, Anyway, that's, those are my thoughts today. Ah, it was amazing. It was, yeah, Keith, go ahead. You'll have to unmute though. Fran, I'm interested in knowing how, how you square uh, what you seem to be feeling about uh, uh, Amelia's speech here in this scene with her choice to, on some level, be the accomplice in the handkerchief scene. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff around that scene where we, we, we argue about what she may or may not have been feeling, but they never seem to jive to me that if she is this person who has reached the point of, I'm not taking this bullshit from him anymore. How in this earlier scene, she makes this choice. Um, well, this scene is 
much later than the earlier scenes. I think she's always trying to curry favor and get in the good graces of her husband. Um, that's where the, uh, I think the abuse comes in. Like, why does she stay with him at all? You know, why did she marry him in the first place? Yeah, There's something about that relationship um, that she wants to save. She doesn't know what he's gonna do with the handkerchief, yeah. She just knows that he wants it. And maybe if she get, gives him that handkerchief, maybe he'll treat her better. Maybe he'll love her a little bit. Maybe she'll get some kind of reward in that relationship that she hasn't been able to get before. But I think she's, and, and she probably does these little things all the time, always trying one more time to see if she can get into his good graces. Somewhere in there, there may have been some love. Yeah. And I think um, not just women to men, but people, human beings to human beings, if you've ever had that love someplace, you want to try to keep recovering it. Yeah. Until it's too late and you say, now we're getting a divorce. Yeah. Or whatever. Or somebody gets killed. Or, yeah. I mean, all sorts of horrible things can happen. But there is that trying, that yearning to make it work as long as you can. And I don't think even in this scene, she said she's going to do it. She's just said, I have the right at this point, the way I've been treated to do it if I want to. But that's, she still hasn't stepped over the line. I think, I mean, yeah. I'm also interested in knowing Jennifer where the, that particular melody for the Willow song came from. Do you know? Um, well, I I actually I learned a version of it in high school um, from like there was some sheet music I think in like the Arden edition or whatever edition I had, and there also are recordings. It's it's I mean there's a it's sort of like written by anonymous, but if you just sort of Google Willow song Othello on YouTube there are a couple of recordings of people singing it and it's it's sort of like you know like a man with a lute or a mandolin you know sort of playing very slowly and you know a woman singing like this I mean it's it sounds very <laughs> like it sounds very like of the Elizabethan era um which, yeah, it's an early modern ballad. We have um, we have the music from from the early modern period. Um, many productions choose to um, commission new music for for the song, but there there is actually not not exactly from Shakespeare's play. There's not the the music written in, but um, a contemporaneous um, ballad that seems to fit. Peter, did you have your, oh, Jessica, go ahead. Oh, well, Peter did have his hand up too. Oh, I was, um, I've always, I don't think I've ever really seen this, uh, but I was thinking about it in the production that I just came off of and just listening to this discussion about Amelia's, you know, choice um, with, with the handkerchief and, you know, not to move into the next scene, but like, I, I've always wondered, it's like, what, you know, what if Amelia really does despise Othello? And in in the kind of like, oh, well, I can do this token and maybe it'll like um, kind of re-glue my relationship with Iago, but what if it's, what if it is also an intention to kind of like throw something in Desdemona's face in, in the sense of like, you shouldn't, you know, like you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be with this person. It isn't right. And I'm going to do this thing that, uh, kind of will create a riff or or maybe there's or what if there's jealousy there you know in like observing a relationship that seems to be like full of love and and on and honesty and beauty and you're not yourself in that relationship so you you do i don't know not i don't want to make amelia like an evil person but i've just wondered what what that would look like if it is totally a conscious decision to kind of like dismantle uh the relationship or to show Desdemona that she deserves more and shouldn't be with someone like that. Um, it would make for a little more of a tricky Amelia, but it just, for the sake of exploration, I was just curious about that. Um, I, I think that's, that's interesting. And one of the reasons I, I like this play and lots of other Shakespeare plays is that it is 
open-ended. You can explore almost anything, yeah? Um, that idea I find intriguing. I don't know exactly what you do with that last scene, the final scene that we're gonna do later um, today uh, with that going into it, but um, sure, why not? Um, explore it, see where it takes you, see if you hit a wall or if you don't, if you can carry the thing all the way through. Indeed. Maddie? Uh, mm, sorry. I was going to say something that I wasn't going to say something. I went back and forth like three times on this because um, I was tracking this thought and then I was thinking about it in the next scene uh, and I was thinking about it backwards. So I was thinking about the fact that she asked the question to Iago what he's going to do with it and then almost takes it back, right? When she doesn't get an answer that's very clear about what he's going to do with it because it's a little suspect. Um, but in terms of Jessica's idea of carrying it through, she really does when we get to that next scene like ram Othello with a lot of insults that if she already didn't like him, I'm sure could could carry that. But it's interesting because a lot of them are um, based on his foolishness, not necessarily based on his evil, right? So it's it depends on what it is about him that she really doesn't like. But I'm excited to see what Jessica does now and I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go into the next scene? Great. Um, I will uh, say we're going to just jump ahead a little bit in the story. So what you will have missed is Iago sort of masterminding this thing to end Cassio's life. So he, he engages Rodrigo and Cassio in a fight. Um, uh, they're each wounded, but not mortally so. So Iago kills Rodrigo himself, um, but runs out of time uh, before he can also um, take Cassio's life um, Lodvico and Graciano appear on the on the scene. Um, so Iago's will start to spin so that he can cook up um, another story since since Cassio has not met his end. So we are going to um, move and join Othello and Desdemona in their in their bed chambers where we're going to pick up. Um, and for this, uh, Keith will play Othello, Felicia will play Desdemona and Jessica will play Amelia. It is the cause, it is the cause. My soul, let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause, yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. But once put out thy light, thou cunningst pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It needs must wither. I'll smell it on the tree. Oh, balmy breath that dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. Once more, once more. Be thus when thou art dead, and I will kill thee and love thee after. Once more. And that's the last. So sweet was ne'er so fatal. I must weep. But they are cruel tears. This sorrow's heavenly. It strikes where it doth love. She wakes. Is there a fellow? Aye, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed the night, Desdemon? I, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime, unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. Alack, my lord, what may you mean by that? Well, do it and be brief. I will walk by. I would not kill thy 
unprepared spirit. No, heaven forfend, I would not kill thy soul. Talk you of killing? Aye, I do. Then heaven have mercy on me. I'm, I'm in with all my heart. If you say so, I hope you will not kill me. <laughs> and yet I fear you for your fatal then when your eyes roll so. Why I should fear, I know not, since guiltiness I know not, but yet I feel I fear. Think on thy sins. They are loves I bear to you. I have the for that thou diest. That death's unnatural that kills for loving. Alas, why gnaw you so your nether lip? Some bloody passion shakes your very frame. These are portents, but yet I hope, I hope they do not point on me. Peace and be still. I will. So, what's the matter? That handkerchief, which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. No, by my life and soul. Send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed. Take heed of perjury. Thou art on thy deathbed. I, but not yet to die. Yes, presently. Therefore, confess thee freely of thy sin. For to deny each article with oath cannot remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan withal. Thou art to die. Then, Lord, have mercy on me. I say amen. And have you mercy, too. I never did offend you in my life, never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might love, I never gave him token. By heaven, I saw my handkerchief in his hand. Oh, perjured woman, thou dost stone my heart and makes me call what I intend to do a murder which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the handkerchief! He found it then. I never gave it him. Send for him hither. Let him confess the truth. He hath confessed. What, my lord? That he hath, as death, used thee. How unlawfully. I... He will not say so. Oh, his mouth is stopped. Honest Iago hath taken order for it. Oh, my fear interprets. What is he dead? Had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge had stomach for them all. Alas, he is betrayed, and I undone. Out, strumpet, weeps thou for him to my face! Oh, banish me, my lord, but kill me not! Down, strumpet! Kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight! Nay, if you strive! But half an hour! Being done, there is no pause! But while I say one prayer... It is too late! Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord! My Lord, my Lord, what ho, my Lord, my Lord! What noise is this? Not dead? Not yet quite dead? I that am cruel am yet merciful. I would not have thee linger in thy pain. So, so... What ho, my Lord, my there? Lord! Oh, good, my Lord, I'd speak a word with you. Uh, yes! Tis Amelia. Uh, by and by. She's dead. Just like she comes to speak of Cassio's death. The noise was high. Ah. No more moving. Still as the grave. Shall she come in? Were it good? I, I think she stirs again. N no. What's best to do? If she come in, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife, my wife, what wife? I have, I have no wife. Oh, insupportable, oh, heavy hour. Me thinks it should be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon and the affrighted globe should yawn at alteration. I do beseech you that I may speak with you. Oh, good, my lord. I, I have forgot thee. Oh, come in, Emilia. Soft, uh, by and by. Let me draw the curtains. Where art thou? What's the matter with thee now? Oh, my good Lord, yonder's foul murder's done. What, now? But now, my Lord. It's the very error of the moon. She comes more nearer earth than she was wont and makes men mad. Cassio, my Lord, hath killed a young Venetian called Rodrigo. Rodrigo killed? And Cassio killed? No, Cassio is not killed. Not Cassio killed? Then murder's out of tune and sweet revenge grows harsh. 
Oh, falsely, falsely murdered. Oh, Lord, what cry is that? That? What? Out, and alas, that was my lady's voice. Help, help. Oh, help. Oh, lady, speak again, sweet Desdemona. Oh, sweet mistress, speak. A guiltless death I die. Oh, who hath done this deed? Nobody. I myself. Farewell. Commend me to my kind lord. Oh, farewell. Why, how should she be murdered? Alas, who knows? You heard her say herself, it was not I. She said so. I must needs report the truth. She's like a liar gone to burning hell. Twas I that killed her. Oh, the more angel she and you, the blacker devil. She turned to folly and she was a whore. Thou dost belie her and thou art a devil. She was false as water. Thou art rash as fire to say that she was false, or she was heavenly true. Cassio did top her. Ask thy husband else. Oh, I were damned beneath all depth in hell, but that I did proceed upon just grounds to this extremity. Thy husband knew it all. My husband? Thy husband. That she was false to wedlock? Aye, with Cassio. Had she been true? If heaven would make me such another world of one entire and perfect chrysolite, I'd not have sold her for it. My husband. Aye, t'was he that told me on her first. An honest man he is, and hates the slime that sticks on filthy deeds. My husband. What needs this iterance, woman? I say thy husband. Oh, mistress, villainy hath made mocks with love. My husband say she was false. He, woman, I say thy husband, dost understand the word? My friend, thy husband, honest, honest Iago. If he say so, may his per pernicious soul rot half a grain a day. He lies to the heart. She was too fond of her most filthy bargain. I will... Duh, do thy worst. This deed of thine is no more worthy heaven than thou wast worthy her. Peace, you were best. Thou hast not a... Thou hast not half that power to do me harm as I have to be hurt. O oh, gull, O oh, dolt, as ignorant as dirt, thou hast done a deed. I care not for thy sword. I'll make thee known, though I lost twenty lives. Help, help, ho, oh, help! The more have killed his mistress. Murder, murder! Great, we're gonna pause right there. Cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> um, Ayana, please. You know, I think it's interesting because a lot of um, actors and critics talk about the temptation scene earlier between Iago and Othello as being really tightly constructed. Uh, but this scene is as well, and it, it contains a lot of um, oddities to it. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if we could get into, you know, Keith, what you think Othello's going through first, and then um, Desdemona's enigmatic response. <laughs> so she dies, she comes back to life, she denies that Othello has killed her. Why? Why all of this? Yeah. Uh, as I've said, I think throughout all, all, all four of these discussions, somewhere in them I've mentioned that I'm, I'm, I'm really only ever interested in humanizing these characters because it's the only way that we can make the play plausible. And with regard to to that and, and Othello specifically, uh, I think that people who resolve to, you know, he, he, he's drunk the, the Iago's Kool-Aid and his own subsequently. And if he is resolved that he has been wronged and that this is indeed an honor killing, which he calls it later, um, that there should be a sense of resolve about it that I don't often see in productions that isn't so highly wrought and histrionic that it makes it phony, that, 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 but that Othello doth protest too much, as it were, whereas he's made some choices and he's not happy about them and he's not happy about losing her, but she's done this thing and he has to do it. Uh, and I think it becomes histrionic only after he realizes that he has been so badly taken, you know, and, 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 and my hope in, in performance would be that that would create a cold calculated killing 
there might 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 be more realistic and more chilling dramatically for 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 an audience. So if it's if it's it doesn't do the histrionic, overly emotive performance, that that might allow for a kind of deeper psychological realism. Is that what you're getting at? I I, I, I think so, and I also think I, I I also think while he has resolved to do this, he is he is emotionally torn. He is he is he is injured by the facts that th these things have happened in this moment with her, in this intimate moment with her. He can say that. He could say, you really hurt me. I saw that handkerchief, you gave it away. You know, I, I'm, 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 you, you hurt, you've done something terrible. You can't, I can't fix it. I can't forgive it. Uh, and, 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 you know, of course, poor thing, she doesn't know what he's, she can't defend it because she does, has no idea. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's something really interesting uh, in pushing back against, uh, this is to 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 interrogate this play through 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 white lenses, which it, it it always is. Different questions are going to be asked if they're asked at all, right? And so my job is to push back on all that interrogation plus what Shakespeare is set up to begin with. So there's no eye rolling. My eyes don't roll so. My nostrils don't flare, and I don't chew on my lip. Right. Ah, okay. So I was wondering. I can't remember if it was Peter or Jessica who said that their performance of Othello really leaned into his potential illness. And I wondered if in this scene, those lines fed into what you thought might be his illness. Because I, I, I take your point, Keith, because I, I don't really want to see an Othello with eye rolling and you know, lip chewing. But, but, but if you're, let's go ahead, I'm sorry. The, fa the fact that she mentions it, we can interrogate in a different way, which yes. is to say, if she mentions it, you are fatal when your eyes roll. So means she's seen it before. Mm -hmm. Means she's seen a behavior, and as a victim of spousal abuse, it is typical for victims of spousal abuse to have seen behavior and ignored it, or or said, you know, I love him anyway, or I need him anyway. So now I'm in this position, but it speaks to her having seen something prior, which is could very well be illness, right? Or abuse, as you, as you say. Uh, which I guess is a form of illness, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, I, and, and I think it's important to look hard at that and to, and to, and to dive deep into what that, what that might be rather than just play the words, you know, yeah. I need, a, I need a, a, a stomping, raving, eye rolling Othello in this scene because that's what it says. Yeah. So Jessica, so I th was it you who said that your performance really, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I, um, Exactly what Keith said, I was having a hard time just kind of doing it because that's what the text is. And so again, you know, doing the mental gymnastics and justification of how to play the action, which is given to us in the text, you know, um, and have it come and have it be rooted in some truth and some kind of like human nature. Um, and so there's also the kind of like right before he goes into when when Amelia comes in and there's the my lord my lord my lord my lord what noise is this you know to me it was kind of almost an action or an indication that he's not quite hearing who's saying my lord that, that there is a moment of kind of like of of um just mental fragments um i like to think of it as like uh, words and, and and thoughts being pushed through a fine mesh screen and it's all kind of getting separated, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that, I mean, that, I leaned into that because that really helped me play that scene because I, I couldn't figure out how he would just be like a kind of a gnarling, snarling person out of anger. Um, but I think that there's a, there's some, and the, the Ud's death too, you know, when he's like, when he had Ud's death, which is only in some of the translations, um, or or edits Edition, that, yeah. mm -hmm. that could be a, a a moment of him losing his words again, you know. Um, so I I I found it interesting to I guess examine the him not being quite in the right mental state here, mm -hmm. um, and and I feel like uh, I mean you, there's there's many ways to do it, but that seemed rooted to me in a way to play it honestly without kind of overly doing the the kind of monstrous, angry, you know, 
er, just erratic behavior for the sake of being erratic, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I feel like it's, uh, it's a combination of both, you know, histrionics and calculation. And we watch that crack apart. Um, I think I agree with you, Keith, he has to be resolved, but I think that we also need to endow how personal um, say, strangling her and the cost um, and to see that. I mean, because I think it's it's rooted, it's just as much rooted in, from a place of love and, and from, as it is from him, his hubris or him being like, I have to right this wrong with the world because you're bad and evil. And even if she does protest, he's made up his mind, but it's not, you know what I mean? He doesn't just do it right away and he talks. And, and I think there's some great little juicy tidbits with the hum and like there's, you know, uh, just thinking about conflict, you know, where you just like the last words you have before you physical, get into physical, you know, like it's not, it's, your heart is thumping in your mouth. And, and um, I think if this were anybody else, I mean, he's killed many people, but like, this is, I think of the, there's a cost that, that we see. And I feel like the language is both very martial and, um, but also very, very uh, vulnerable. And then, you know, we'll see what happens like I, next, but I feel like it either gives you some place further to go to go from I'm right to killing myself you know it's like it's like a, a, a very to me a very fall a long fall for someone like him and you don't you know get a lot of time he doesn't speak a lot right before he does it but so yeah I, my, my point is is I think that um, it's most interesting to me when those things are juxtaposed and, and they're fighting like they're kind of batting him around and it and he has moments where he's collected and moments where he's off the rails and like that that when she it's all that was all, it's always been such a tricky moment like when uh when he says uh she's like uh that what or like you heard her say herself i did it was not i or like what was what no there's there's the, that comedy wants to creep in there and it's that the comedy that we we're talking about before yes. where it's just like everyone's so on edge that it's like yeah it's always been like a tricky tricky and you know what line also that not Cassio killed, which is like grammatically weird, <laughs> like yeah. not Cassio killed. Right. It, it does invite a chuckle, right? But, and so to, you know, do you lean into it? Do you pull way back from that? I, yeah, I, I think that the vowels in those exchanges really need to be road, do you know what I mean? For all that they're worth. Cause I think that unlocks like the arrhythmic structure of the dialogue if that makes sense yeah. to really change with the changes like technically and i think it unlocks like erratic um, it, it gives clues i think great so felicia your desdemona was very empathic so <laughs> i wonder what you made of uh <laughs> Her dying, her coming back to life, her exonerating Othello. <laughs> Who is your Desdemona? I just think this scene is bloody awful. Like on a sort of like emotional human level, it's really hard to like watch on stage. I've ne I've never like been okay watching a, a like this scene on stage. It's so because it's so domestic. It feels like. It's just really visceral to watch um, this murder happen in this way. And then the, yeah, exonerating him at the end, I think, you know, all of the conversations that we've been having about like how to make a more nuanced, tougher Desdemona, how do you then make sense of her exonerating him and not becoming a sort of a martyr um, and a saint throughout the play because that's the easiest explanation for that moment right that she's like the purest of pure right through to her death um uh yeah and it's really hard to find another compelling reason reason for her to exonerate him uh particularly after she says that she's dying a guiltless death like and then she says that she's killed herself it's a really weird turn 
Maddie, you're nodding in agreement. Just nodding in agreement. Yeah, I think that, I think that, because it's been interesting. It's been really interesting watching so many of the choices throughout different scenes that like enabled me to be like, oh, like maybe Desdemona, what happens if she's not as sincere? But then it's like, okay, well, if she's just momentarily resurrected to say something and that something is her like, being like, oh no, no, I did this to myself. It's like, okay, well that's not sarcastic because she was just temporarily resurrected to, from the dead in order to like, you know, like there's only so many things you can do. Um, so I was just very nodding and supportive of Alicia there. <laughs> I, always, I, I, I was always thinking that if the true belief is that if you, you know, if she knows that Othello is not going to go to heaven because what he's done is wrong, that maybe the act to lie before she dies is so that they go to the same place which would be an act of love, right? But why like, does she want to go to the same place with the guy who just killed her? <laughs> I was, well, no, I mean, that's th that's fair, but I'm just, I was thinking like, in the terms of like, love is always the strongest choice. And like, if it's a conscious decision that she wants their souls to be together because she does love him and knows that there's something wrong, you know, that like, I, I don't know. I, I, I agree that the most obvious, or not the most obvious way to play it is that like, I'm gonna be pure till the death, but I don't know, what if it's darker? What if it's that, that she really does want their soul, if she truly believes that, she really does want their souls to reunite because she, in a moment, in a flash moment, recognizes what's been done, right? And that no one's gonna win in this situation, but she still wants to go uh, meet in the afterlife. Just, just for the really sake of exploration, I don't know. Juicy Sorry. thought. Um, something just came to me right this now, just four times in. I just had this thought, if we take like a Mercutio sort of approach, a pox on both your houses in the sense, and just in, I guess this is in the way, this is an idea for staging, but I just had this idea that like, what if, you know, after he's done this to her, she hates him and she, and there's a thing of like, I did this to myself, not like, you know, fucking around with these damn moors, but like I did this, I, I allowed myself, I put myself in this position. So, you know, commend me to my kind Lord. I always, I just had this picture of her laying on her bed, on, on, the, on the bed and pointing at him. And like that being like a, not like the, an opposite thing of, you know, like you did, you know what I mean? Like, I think that there's, there's room because everything that you, everyone has said is true. There's not a lot of other <clears throat> approaches to this given I just had this thought, I was like, what if, you know, he, she's not, she's cursing him or she's just like, she's not, I don't know, maybe that's the no, it foisting. Makes, the, it makes sense that by choosing to marry him, she did this to herself. That's where right. it's complicated too. It's like she's in her literal marriage bed sheets and she's dead. And the person who she chose to marry against her parents' will has just killed her. So that's also complicated. That's also complicated because there's also ways she could be cursing him very directly in relation yeah. to that. And yeah. it's also true that in revenge narratives, the person who exacts the revenge has to have the reveal. And so in this moment, she's denying him the reveal. Like that is sort of like taking down, it's like, <clears throat> I'm not even gonna give you that. <laughs> it supports this whole theory that I have that she's got a spine of steel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I want her to, I want her. <laughs> We desperately want her to. Jennifer and then Fran. I, I I don't know. I was going to kind of advocate for the sort of, I mean, I, you know, I don't like the, you know, sort of privileged rich girl, but there is something about that last moment, aside from the like miraculously coming back to life that I find so incredibly beautiful. Like the idea that she's like, like, I'm like, I, I, I am guiltless. And I still love this man. It, it sort of harkens back to the previous scene of like, if, if you love someone, it's like the last thing out of her mouth is like, I tell him that I love him. Yeah. That to me is so devastating. And that's part of what makes the tragedy at the end so horrible to witness. So I'm a little bit of a traditionalist in that respect. Uh, all right, Fran. Uh, I was going to say pretty much the same thing. I, I think we take for granted that unconditional love means something else. Mm -hmm. And unconditional love is unconditional love. We tend to understand it between parents and children, 
we wouldn't question if a mother in her dying breath said that the son who just killed her did not. Yes. We would understand that. It's much harder for us to understand unconditional love between strangers, as it were, people who don't have that uh, familiar relationship. But I think that's kind of the kind of love that Shakespeare is interested in. That's, that's it. Yes. And it doesn't surprise me at all that she, she doesn't want him to be found guilty. I'll take, you know, from, from bad mend. Yeah. She does that all the way through the end. And it has nothing to do with her being spineless. I think she can be all sorts of things throughout this play. But the underlying part has to be that she loves him unconditionally. Mm, There's okay. no going back. There's no, I'll try something else. There's no, I did love him, but now I don't. It doesn't exist in this world. And I don't think it exists for that character. That's do you think it. that we give martyrs a bad name? Because... I, 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 I don't. don't think, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't think she thinks she's a martyr. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think that she thinks she's a, being a, being you know a martyr. But I feel like you know people like the, the the idea or people viewing her last gesture as martyr being martyred like full of martyrdom. And then I, so my question, based on what you're saying, because I completely agree with you about timeless love, love that's that's you know that's what he's writing about that, that that's the tragedy of, of a love this big um and so when so i guess my question is 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 martyr i don't know a way to describe that and if, if so if, is that bad i'm just putting stuff out there um, i think i think we should hang on to fran's idea about like different types of familial love which Shakespeare explores in, in many, many plays. And that you're right, I think a parental love is almost, and for us too, is still understood as, as unconditional. And Shakespeare in, in several other plays thinks about siblings having that kind of love as well. Um, but what is it to, ha to have or offer that kind of love to someone who's not your blood relation, but who is nonetheless family? So let's Keep that in our minds. I wanna to say to the viewers, remember that you can submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We're gonna finish the reading of the play and then we'll turn to your questions then. So Dawn, set us up. Yes, yeah, so we are gonna continue right where we've left off, but we are doing some casting changes. So uh, Peter will take over the role of Othello. Uh, Maddie will take over the role of Amelia. Jessica will now play Montano. Fran will play Graciano. Keith will move over to the role of Iago. Jennifer will play Lodovico. And Alfredo will play Cassio. Um, so we're right where we left off. Um, Amelia has just yelled, the more have killed my mistress. And Montano, Graciano, and Iago enter. What is the matter? How now, General? Oh, are you come, Iago? You have done well that men must lay their murders on your neck. What is the matter? Disprove this villain if thou beest a man. He says thou toldst him that his wife was false. I know thou didst not. Thou art not such a villain. Speak for my heart is full. I told him what I thought and told him no more than what he found himself was apt and true. But did you ever tell him she was false? I did. You told a lie, an odious, damned lie. Upon my soul, a lie, a wicked lie. She false with Cassio. Did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, mistress, go to, charm your tongue. I will not charm my tongue. I am bound to speak. My mistress here lies murdered in her bed, and your reports have set the murder on. Nay, hey, stare not, masters. It is true indeed. Tis a strange truth. Oh, monstrous to act. Villainy, 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 I think upon it. I think I smell it. Oh, villainy, I thought so then. I'll kill myself for grief. Oh, villainy, villainy! What are you, mad? I charge you, get you home. Good gentlemen, let me have leave to speak. Tis proper I obey him, but not now. Perchance, Iago, I will ne'er go home. Oh, oh. 
Nay, lay thee down and roar, for thou hast killed the sweetest innocent that e'er did lift up eye. Oh, she was foul. I scarce did know you, uncle. There lies your niece, whose breath indeed these hands have newly stopped. I know this act shows horrible and grim. Poor Desdemon, I am glad thy father's dead. Thy match was mortal to him, and pure grief shore his old thread in twain. Did he live now, this sight would make him do a desperate turn, yea, curse his better angel from his side and fall to reprobance. This is pitiful. But yet Iago knows that she with Cassio hath the act of shame a thousand times committed. Cassio confessed it. And she did gratify his amorous works with that recognizance and pledge of love which I first, I saw it in his hand. It was a handkerchief, an antique token my father gave my mother. Oh God, oh heavenly God. Please hold your peace. Will out, twill out, I, peace. No, I will speak as liberal as the North. Let heaven and men and devils, let them all, all, all cry shame against me, yet I'll speak. Be wise and get you home. I will not. Ah, your sword upon a woman? Oh, thou dull moor, that handkerchief thou speakest of, I found by fortune and did give my husband for often with a solemn earnestness, more than indeed belonged to such a trifle, he begged of me to steal it. Villainous whore! She give it Cassio. No, alas, I found it, and I did give it my husband. Milf, thou liest. By heaven, I do not, I do not, gentlemen. Oh, murderous coxcomb, what should such a fool do with so good a wife? Are there no stones in heaven but what serves for the thunder, precious villain? The woman falls. Sure, he hath killed his wife. Aye, aye. Oh, lay me by my mistress's side. He's gone, but his wife's killed. Tis a notorious villain. Take you this weapon which I have here recovered from the moor. Come, guard the door without, let him not pass, but kill him rather, all after that same villain, for tis a damned slave. I am not valiant, <clears throat> neither, but every puny whipster gets my sword. But why should honor outlive honesty? Let it go all. Long bowed, lady. Hark, canst thou hear me? I will play the swan and die in music. Willow, willow, willow. More, she was chaste. She loved thee, cruel more. So come my soul to bliss as I speak true. So speaking as I think, alas, I die. I have another weapon in this chamber. It is a sword of Spain, the Icebrook's temper. Ah, here it is. Uncle, I must come forth. If thou attempt it, it will cost thee dear. Thou hast no weapon, and perforce must suffer. Look in upon me then, and speak with me, or naked as I am, I will assault thee. What is the matter? Behold, I have a weapon. A better never, never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I have seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword I have made my way through more impediments than twenty times your stop. But, oh, vain boast. Who can control his fate? It is not so now. Be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. Here is my journey's end. Here is my butt and very sea mark of my utmost sail. Do you go back dismayed? It is a lost fear, man, but a rush against Othello's brush, breast, and he retires. Where should Othello go? Now. 
How does thou look now? Lil starred wench, pale as thy smock. When we shall meet at Compton, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch at it. <gasps> Cold? Cold, my girl, even like thy chastity, oh, cursed, cursed slave. Whip me, ye devils, from the possession of this. Heavenly sights, blow me about in winds, roast me in sulfur, wash me and steep down gulfs of liquid fire. <laughs> Dead. There's the moon. Where is this rash and most unfortunate man? That's he that was Othello. Here I am. Where is that viper? Bring the villain forth. I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. If that thou beast a devil, I cannot kill thee. Wrench his sword from him. I bleed, sir, but not killed. I am not sorry, neither I'd have thee live, for in my sense tis happiness to die. Oh, thou, Othello, that wert once so good. Fallen in the practice of a cursed slave, what shall be said to thee? Why, anything. An honorable murderer, if you will. For not did I in hate, but all in honor. This wretch hath part confessed his villainy. Did you and he consent in Cassio's death? I. Dear General, I never gave you cause. Do believe it, and I ask your pardon. Will you, I pray, demand that demi devil why he had thus ensnared my soul and body? No, you know. From this time forth, I never shall speak word. What? Not to pray? Torments will ope your lips. Well, thou dost best. Sir, you shall understand what hath befallen, which, as I think, you know not. Here is a letter found in the pocket of the slain Roderigo, and here another. The one of them imports the death of Cassio to be undertook by Roderigo. <laughs> most heathenish and most gross. Now... Here's another discontented paper found in his pocket too. And this, it seems, Roderigo meant to have sent this damned villain, but that, belike, Iago in the nick came in and satisfied him. Oh, thou pernicious king. How came you, Cassio, by that handkerchief that was my wife's? I found it in my chamber. And he himself confessed, but even now that there he dropped it for a special purpose which wrought to his desire. Oh. There is besides in Roderigo's letter how he upbraids Iago, that he made him brave me upon the watch, whereon it came that I was cast. And even but now he spake after long seeming dead, Iago hurt him. Iago set him on. You must forsake this room and go with us. Your power and your command is taken off, and Cassio rules in Cyprus. For this slave, if there be any cunning cruelty that can torment him much and hold him long, it shall be his. You shall close prisoner rest till that the nature of your fault be known to the Venetian state. Come, bring him away. Talk to you. A word or two before you go. I have done the state some service and they know it. No more of that. I pray you in your letters when you shall these unlucky deeds relate, speak of me as I am. Nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Then must you speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well. 
were not easily jealous, but being wrought perplexed in the extreme. Of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away, richer than all his tribe. Of one whose subdued eyes, albeit unused to the melting mood, drops tears as fast as the Arabian trees, their medicinable gum. Said you doubt this. And say, besides, that in Aleppo, once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state. I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. Oh, bloody period. All that spoke is marred. I kissed thee ere I killed thee. No way but this. Chilling so I This did I fear, but thought he had no weapon, for he was great of heart. No oh, Spartan dog more fell than anguish, hunger, or the sea. Look on the tragic loading of this bed. This is thy work. The object poisons sight. Let it be hid. Graciano, keep the house and seize upon the fortunes of the Moor, for they succeed to you. To you, Lord Governor, remains the censure of this hellish villain. The time, the place, the torture. Oh, enforce it. Myself will straight abroad and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relate. Wow, wow. I have to give it up to this group of actors, so tremendous. I was having visceral responses to a play that I've seen many times and even just experiencing through the Zoom was like, ah. And there were lines that you know, I've studied this play for, for years and there were lines that I was like, wait, what? <laughs> How have I missed all this time that Amelia says she's gonna kill herself? <laughs> that took me by surprise. I think I've just glossed over that bit um, in the past. Reactions. I just want to apologize for having muted myself. It's one of those interesting moments where you think somebody else has dropped their line. Like, why, why is there silence after I've just said my words? And you hear someone else say your words and you go, oh, oh, I see. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Peter. Oh. So Peter, how did the ending feel for you? Uh, well, I'm, I'm still kind of stewing on what, what Keith was laying down just in terms of the, like, you know, do you leave yourself a place to go if, you know, so I was, I was kind of like in my head a little bit just about, like, but just still fighting against, um, you know, the, I, I don't know, just still trying to have some sort of balance in there. I think it's really interesting that he doesn't speak a lot when everybody um, pours into the bed chamber and uh, gives, him a lot of time to do whatever, take it in, not take it in, you know, but just, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of writes itself, but then, uh, you know, what do we, do we, do we care anymore? And I think the, 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 the job is to, you know, still fight to win and resolve of it's, you know, it's better to, to die than there's no place to go from here. So, and because we all know that that's, that's where it's going, I still think the objective is to die with as much, maybe I'm just being Captain Obvious, but as much dignity as can be left, um, you know. There's, I, I, this is particularly, uh, 
I won't say fun, but there's a it's the last scene to play, and like it's been a long run. Um, and I think that there's like uh, catharsis, like this release. It's and there's just so much dynamic and like you know like there's so much going on and like the you know it's it's a, it's a great scene to play um, in terms of ensemble you know in like public private all the things are op operating you know so um, yeah and then you know when I'm done I'm just glad the shit's over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo, had you unmuted yourself before because you wanted to say something? I want, did, wanted to make sure you had. No, I was, I was just, just muting myself, but <laughs> I'm happy to jump in there. Um, it's interesting playing Cassio at the end here because, like, his very last line, it, he still says he was great of heart, and it's like a person who's still like just really believes in this guy as well. And so we're talking about that sort of uh, unconditional love, and this is like unconditional loyalty that he has to this person. <laughs> No matter what it seems to me. Uh, oh, that's brilliant. And I hadn't ever thought about that before, that if we're thinking about the way that um, Othello assumes that Iago has that unconditional love for him, but it's actually Cassio that has it potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, Maddie? Uh, I was just thinking about, in, in relationship to, we, we flagged about not having noticed before that Amelia so she's going to kill herself. But I was just thinking about how in a, a lot of Shakespeare's canon, I think, well, and other, I think, uh, old plays uh, in general, there's this thing that happens sometimes where the female characters, like once they say they're going to kill themselves, it's like a form of liberation because now there's like some, like what the stakes have shifted dramatically. Like Juliet does this, a lot of people do this, or once like suddenly they're like, okay, I, I'm willing to kill myself. Then suddenly like the sort of, um, bounds of what they can do expands um, fairly dramatically because this, the, there's nothing, they don't have anything to lose. Um, and I was thinking um, in the very last line, I mean, as someone who really also didn't have very much familiarity at all with, with um, this play or this character, I'm no Fran in terms of my relationship to Amelia. So um, definitely just discoveries. So in the last line though, I was thinking about this, this whole relationship she has to being able to die speaking truth and wondering how many other things Iago has said and done mm like that she's aware of, like not just to Othello, but like what that sort of a life would be to like know so many things that he may or may not have done and to have had, like been responsible for keeping them all secret. Mm. Um, it was just an interesting um, thing I thought in contrast to like the liberation of um, dying speaking truth. Um, that was just something that I noticed. Mm. So yeah, Fran, I, do, yeah, oh, go Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, please Fran, please. Oh, you have to, okay. uh, I, I, I was just listening. I thought that was, that was interesting, Madeline, what you just said. I still think there has to be, just based on what happens in this play, there has to be the surprise for Amelia too, that he would do this. He may have done a lot of things in his life that were evil, but this is far beyond anything even she could conceive of him actually doing. Uh, and I think that's just important for the play and important for that, that character. I think, I think so too. I don't think she would give him the, hang I mean, maybe there's some world in which she could justify, but I don't think she would give him the handkerchief if she thought it would lead to this. And I think that that's sort of what that seed rise upon is like suddenly the realization that you were actually complicit in the oh, fact that there's a Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna add to that too, cause it seems, you know, I don't know this play very, very well, the nuances of it, but I'm, I'm always curious about Iago and what his intentions are, but specifically what his expectations are by when he employs this plan, like what does he think is gonna happen? <laughs> and the fact that it ends this way, I, I'm just wondering if it surprises him or, and I mean, that's an actor's decision, that's a director's decision, but I'm very curious, like, you know, what in the text, what clues are there on the text to that, or if it's something that mental gymnastics you have to create as a as the actor who's playing that role I don't know I think that's a great question right like so it what in hatching this plan which he takes a while to hatch in the play is the is the end result annihilation or is it that he's you know taking the role of is he becoming the general is that the you know I mean I think that's a really really good question 
Dearis, I think we have probably lots of questions from the audience. Are, are there some that you want to highlight for us? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Ayana. Um, and thanks again to all of the wonderful actors for such an excellent reading of um, this very complex play um, throughout the month. I have really enjoyed it, so thank you. Um, and actually, I would like to take the privilege and ask a question myself first um, for this week. And so I'll just kind of start with my question. We can go there and then we'll ask some of the um, brilliant questions that we have in the um, Q&A. So the first question that I have is, um, we have received many positive messages from our viewers throughout the month, many of whom are scholars, students, actors, and some who are simply fans of Shakespeare. They have said this project was necessary, timely, and some have even said it is the best reading of Othello they have experienced. This event was made possible because the Red um, Bull Theater knew how important it was to step back and listen to Black, Indigenous, people of color's voices, especially in this current climate. What message do you think or hope this event will send to theater companies across the world? How important is it to not only cast BIPOC actors for Shakespearean roles, but to also create safe spaces for these actors to share their experiences? Brilliant question, yes. <laughs> yeah, what's the message you want to send to other theater companies? Mm -hmm. uh, something that I think they should know by now is that there is a lot of talent in this country, um, a lot of experiences, uh, and we should always have been there. But certainly in, I even hesitate to say the year, 2020, certainly, and moving forward, uh, theaters, step up to the plate, yeah? Do the thing you should always have been doing to your advantage, yes? because there are voices and people out there with stories to tell that haven't always been told them, and they need to be told because we're all part of the world. <clears throat> if I may, uh, sorry, Jessica, go ahead. No, no. no. If uh, I think that it's in, 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 in these COVID times, um, it's deeply gratifying to workshop table read, you know, um, deconstruct a play of this size and with, and, and switching the casting and hearing different voices. And I, it's deeply uh, illuminating how necessary this process is. And unless you are in production, uh, we rarely, has have this as an example of uh, what theater companies are working on or what they're doing. And so I would challenge uh, <clears throat> every other theater company that's out there that's struggling, that's, you know, trying to make uh, connection and keep community um, afloat and vibrant to, to see this as uh, a possibility uh, for, you know, uh, the way that we need to get down. Um, as creatives and, 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 but it's just so important, you know, like um, I feel so uh, f fulfilled and, and, and inspired by just getting the work on the work and talk about it with, with people who are as passionate and uh, about it and learning things, you know, um, it's just so incredibly important. Um, so I look forward to uh, the next one. <laughs> I just want to piggyback off of that, um, not as eloquently, but <laughs> in a way, just uh, doubling. I know, like, not a lot of actors love table work, but with a piece like this and many other pieces, particularly with the classics, like doubling the table work, like, have time to set aside for the kind of scholarly academic part of it with the words and, and the beats and all of that kind of stuff, but really, really dedicate, you know, a good amount of time to discussions like like these um because i feel like it is important and i know that uh, the way that our theater is structured you know we we have 
you know, three weeks or four weeks of rehearsal at best, you know, and then you do something for like two months and that's it. And um, maybe there's something in having a, a longer duration of a project, particularly with something like this. So you can really tap into the community and the network and really make sure you're, you're representing and bringing the play to life in this moment, as opposed to just doing it as it already exists. So. I just wanted to also say like, one of the things that I found incredibly illuminating about this process and getting to hear from all of you, many of whom have like done this play a bunch of times is that there is a real sort of like psychic and sociological and artistic cost to what we choose to canonize and how we choose and, and what we choose to stage and restage. And that often like comes on the backs of people who are already historically disenfranchised and excluded by the canon. Um, so even just thinking about like, you know, if, if, if you choose to do any of Shakespeare's plays again, uh, who does that cost? Uh, and it could be people within your production. It very likely is people within your production and making time and space to address that uh, in the work process. Yeah. I love that, especially since many theaters are employing intimacy coaches. What about like a soul healer or something? <laughs> you know, like someone who's there to, to help relieve the burden of that, that psychic cost. Jennifer, Alfredo, do you guys wanna hop in? I, I just wanted to add also that on top of everyone's comments, which I've found fantastic, is that audiences, like audiences are hungry for this kind of dialogue. They, they I, in the past, I feel like I've, I've, I've spoken up in the room and it's, I've paid a price, you know, mm -hmm. I've incurred the wrath of the director or the scorn of my fellow actors for asking certain questions and for creating conflict, but audiences, people know that life is complicated and people are neither good nor bad and, and people are hungry for that. And so in addition to like putting, you know, actors of all different races and backgrounds on your stages, know that your audiences are, are the same as well and that they have the same um, desires to see themselves reflected in the art too. Yeah, yeah, I don't have much more to add. Um, just that, you know, oftentimes I found myself in a room where I am the only BIPOC artist, or there's maybe one or two others, and um, they look to me to sort of sign off on any sort of decision in the script or something. And, and that's an awkward position to be in. But to be in a room with a lot of diverse voices like this, I feel like it only strengthens the work. It just, it, and also we're, we're not a monolith too. Like I don't speak for all Latinx people. Like we all have individual thoughts within it. And it's actually the diversity of that thought too that, that helps to really enrich uh, these pieces. I just want to say also to just know why you're doing them, right? Because something that's come up is it, it sounds like there's a lot of productions of Othello that actually are centering Iago. And like, if you're essentially creating a production that is centering the voice of Iago, like, like inter why are you not interrogating that, right? Like, why are you just continuing? Um, it, yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, I mean, you really need to really look at yourself in the mirror if that's the choice that you're making. Um, so just really asking like, it, you know, and, and again, like um, I'm someone very caught between like friends, like I love Shakespeare forever. And like, you know, the fact that I, I just, I grapple with the ways in which these tools have been used against my people as a weapon. And just knowing that like, if they're going to be done, then we need to know why they're being done and actually be having the conversations in deep ways around the work. And like any individual production could have this conversation as a part of its rehearsal process. And honestly, if it's not having this conversation as part of its rehearsal process, it's probably doing some damage that it should, that should really be thought in terms of the process around it. Keith? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Keith, did you want to weigh in before? Mm -hmm. No, I've all said it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Diara. Sorry to cut you off there. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, yeah, thank you so much for answering my question. Um, and I, I really like this idea that Jessica proposes of um, spending more time with the play, even after acting and really thinking or thinking through it. I think that's a really good question. I mean, a good comment. Um, so I think we can wrap up with um, Kim X is a really great question that I think is good to leave off on. 
Um, and she says, if you were able, and this is from Dr. Kim Hall, um, she says, if you're able to do this again, what play would you choose? Do you think it would resonate as much as Othello? Oh, okay. If we're taking over Red Bull again, what play are we doing? Okay. I love it. Taming. <laughs> oh, Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Merchant of Venice. So we're going to do all the toxic plays? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah Tempest. Like <laughs> this? Yeah. Okay. To really be able to deconstruct it? We'll do Tamburlaine. We'll do Revenge. We'll throw some non Shakespeare in there too. Some, some messed up plays from other people, other dead ones, guys. <laughs> okay. So we're doing Shrew. Uh, merchant and and uh, and te well. tempest measure for measure we'll throw in tamberlane <laughs> fran did you have one you wanted to do no uh, i think shrew is the hardest one it's uh, and it starts with the title i mean it just it's hard to get to the play once you say taming of the shrew but um i think it, i think it's doable but i personally think it's the most difficult i'm gonna well, let's see, I wouldn't I disagree with you, but I'm also thinking about uh, Titus Andronicus. Um, just uh, for political, I don't know, just for like, as I said, I think in the first, you know, Aaron, the more single handedly kind of taking down or tearing down imperialism from the inside. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's so, you know, in Rome. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of applicable. Well, I'd like to unpack that play some more. King John, and another one. It's like, anyway, like there's a lot of. There are there are questions about almost all of them. Yeah, and um, I I don't even know what to do with Titus Andronicus. So sure, <laughs> yeah, I mean I I'm, I kind of tend to throw up my hands on that one. But talk about sure. emotional cost, though. That one is. I mean, that play is. I imagine it's. I played Lavinia and I imagine it's Ugh. the the pain is as comparable to playing Othello. It's horrible. <laughs> the first time I went to see Titus, I made the mistake of without fully being Titus aware at the time, so I was very young, going with my sister who happens to have one arm. She has a congenital limb. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not happy. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, that's my, yeah. So there's just so many levels too of everything happening in that play. Yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, I would welcome the chance to be in a room, even if it's a Zoom room, with any of you and all of you again. And I want to end by thanking Red Bull for being so generous to give us this platform. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, all the staff at Red Bull. This was a bold choice, and um, I appreciate you uh, investing. Uh, your time and resources on us. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Maddie, Peter, Keith, Alfredo, Dieris, Dawn, Felicia, Jessica. It was an honor to spend this time with you. And uh, let's let's come back and do it. Do something else. We'll do something else. <laughs> thank awesome. you, audience. This was a great joy. Thank, <laughs> thank you all. You. All thank of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>